Good morning, everyone. And welcome, welcome, welcome to Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shante Charles. I hope that you all are having a great and wonderful morning. I certainly am because it's Friday. <laughs> it is Friday. And I'm excited because it's Friday. I'm excited because it's another day that God has allowed us to have on the earth. Good morning, Lady Barbara. Good morning, Pastor Ben. And just remember for this holiday season, don't get your tinsel in a tangle. However you wanna take that. <laughs> Good morning, Lady Stephanie. Don't get your tinsel in a tangle, people. Don't let the jingle bells and the bright lights and uh, the pressure that often comes with making the season bright. Um, I grew up around a lot of people, um, even of course into my growing adult years, I just observe people and how this season is supposed to be the season that you make things bright, but most people um, wind up driving themselves into a frenzy or they wind up driving themselves into debt or into a whole lot of stress. So they don't even get a chance to enjoy the season or make the season bright because of all of the quote unquote um, holiday expectations that our friends, sometimes our family, sometimes society puts on people around this time that it has become so commercialized um, to the point where, yes, people may have a wonderfully decorated home. I don't do the decorations at all, outdoors or indoors. Um, I usually would do a nativity set, um, but I believe my nativity set is still in storage. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, they have all of these wonderful decorations outside and indoors. And they may have lots of presents under the Christmas tree. I don't do Christmas trees either. Sorry, I'm not that girl. Um, yeah, and they may have presents ready to give to everyone. My present is I love you all year round, 365 days a year um, and 366 on a leap year. So, <laughs> um by the time they get through uh, making the season bright, excuse me, by the time they get through making the season bright, they're not bright. Matter of fact, some of them are angry, mad, depressed, thinking about the uh, how they're gonna um, redo all of their budgeting come January because they've overspent in December. So, I just encourage you this year, don't get your tinsel in a tangle, right? If there are specific people that you want to gift something to, do that. But, um, you know, one way that you can definitely save money is by making things for people, um, cooking things for people, if you're into that. And really putting a personal touch into what you give people for the holiday season, right? Because I know some people go all out and then they look at their account and they're like, OMG. <laughs> what am I going to do come January 1st for things I know I need to pay on a regular basis? But because I have been making the season bright in December... I have now thrown my budget out of whack. And at some point in your life, you have to decide what's more important. Throwing my budget out of whack or sticking to my budget and my financial responsibilities and obligations because at the end of the day, nobody's really going to feel sorry for you if you are in a grind come January. So I just have learned... Um, I remember one year I got a 
a store credit card. This was years back, probably 10 or more years back. I got a, I got a store credit card for all of the men that I had in my life. OMG, because I have a lot of them. So I, I didn't even get a store credit card for me. I, I didn't have any women's clothing store credit cards. I only had this one because of all the males in my life, my husband, my uncle, my pastor at the time, et cetera, et cetera, so that I could, you know, purchase things for them, you know, and I was paying the, the minimum budget on, on the card until I couldn't pay the minimum budget on the card. And then it spiraled out of control. And when it spiraled out of control, that's when I realized I will never, ever, ever do a department store or anybody's credit card again. So when I paid it off, <laughs> I was standing at the counter and I cut it up in front of them. And I said, thank you. I will not be doing this ever again. And that was like over 10 years ago. And it works for me. If I don't have it, I'm not buying it. That's just the bottom line. So I just want to encourage you. In all of your wonderful shopping this year, don't get your tinsel in a tangle. Don't get your household into a, a place where you are now stressing out because of the holiday season. All right? So that's my two cents on that. Excuse me. So let's talk a little bit about some business tips, and then I'm going to let you go. I don't think I'm going to be on for an hour today. We're going to talk about the power of small, why little things make all the difference. We're going back to the little book of business wisdom. Um, and we're going to hear from a interesting character who I believe has a movie coming out. Um, the founders of The Greatest Show on Earth. Anybody heard about that film? I think the film is actually called The Greatest Show on Earth. And it's about the story of P.T. Barnum and how the circus, how they founded the circus and how they recruited the um, people and how it got started. But we're actually going to read today from P.T. Barnum's own words of advice to those in business, even though um, The Greatest Show on Earth has finally had run its course. I believe last year they announced that they were closing. And then lastly, we're going to look at the beginning of this book called Truth Matters, Truth Matters, A Citizen's Guide to Separating Facts from Lies and Stopping Fake News in Its Tracks. As you can see, it's not a very long book. It's not a very lengthy read. And by the way, little tip for those of you who are um, writing, okay, this would be considered a novella size. Anything that is 200 pages and under is considered novella size, all right? And so um, if you are advertising a book that you wrote, please make sure that your visuals match your actual product, okay? I'm seeing a lot of people who put up book advertising and you think that you're going to get like actually get a lengthy read. But when you get the book in the mail, it's like 50 pages or 60 pages. OK, and your advertising, meaning your visual advertising, your marketing does not reflect that. That's what we call in the industry a visual lie. OK, <laughs> so if you have a smaller book or you have a pamphlet size book, Try to make sure that your advertising matches your book, all right? So when I advertise my books, as you can see up there, it looks like my, my books are pretty lengthy, and that's because they are. So if you order one of my books in the mail, <clears throat> let me just pull one of my author samples, all right? You see this? This is about 139 pages, okay? If you order one of my novels, it is a lengthy read. It's over 400 pages, all right? So my, my book advertisement matches the volume of what you're going to get when you receive 
my book. All right. So again, you do not want to come off. You do not want to come off as a person um, who participates in false advertising of your book. All right. And I know a lot of especially pastors and leaders are getting into the whole book industry and writing industry. And many of them are not getting counsel on the basic things. They're just writing and they're trusting whoever is publishing their work to um, to basically do it right for them. And the reality is, if you are just entrusting your work over to someone and you don't even know like what they're doing with your product or the right questions to ask, you can come off looking like someone who participates in fake advertising. So I just wanted to say that, um, that if you are a new author, or you are someone who's getting ready to release something for the new year, make sure that your advertisement reflects what your product actually looks like. All right. And the length of your project. That was just a tip. That was for free. All right. So let's go on to the power of small. I hope everybody has uh, something to drink in front of them. I'm drinking a little bit of coffee this morning. And today in the power of small, we are talking about how thank you goes a long way. Put some hearts on the screen. If you've had someone tell you thank you this week put some hearts on the screen if you've had someone tell you thank you this week one person two persons just two only two people had someone tell them thank you this week that's not good all right three okay thank you goes a long way the author says, when we published our book, The Power of Nice, comedian Rosie O'Donnell talked about the principles we described on a network television show. Whoa, it'll be OK. <laughs> Back in the early 80s, when Rosie was a comedian doing stand up, she heard about an incredible opportunity, a chance to work with MTV as a VJ. Rosie was a young comic looking for an opportunity to move up from local clubs to the national audience. So she decided to go for it. She made the first cut and was flown to New York for another audition with one of the MTV's top executives. I did not get it, she said, but I wrote him a thank you note and said thank you for giving me a shot. In an industry of outsized egos, such graciousness did not go unnoticed. So the MTV executive took the liberty of forwarding her audition tape to VH1. Rosie landed that gig and launched her meteoric rise in television. Yes, she got the job because of her incredible talent, but VH1 would have never discovered her if it hadn't been for her quick thank you note and the MTV executive decision to pass her tape along instead of tossing it aside. The simple act of saying thank you often determines whether an encounter is experienced as good or bad. Now, let me put this caveat in here because <laughs> sometimes when we have an unpleasant experience or something happens to us that we don't like or we don't appreciate, sometimes people use thank you as a sarcastic retort, right? So for example, if I get bad service in a grocery store, right? Sometimes people might would turn around and say, well, thank you, <laughs> right? So that's not what they're talking about. They're not talking about using thank you as a sarcastic way of telling people off. They're actually talking about having a sincere appreciation for someone trying to uh, get something to you or someone trying to do something for you or someone having done something for you. Catherine Roster of the University of New Mexico interviewed 186 people who had given a gift the recipient didn't like. There were a number of ways the gift givers came to realize that their waffle makers and polka dot ties were not a hit. But the one that did the most damage to, damage to the relationship 
was the recipient's failure to say thank you. When asked what the person receiving the gift could have done differently to make the situation better, the gift givers overwhelmingly said a simple thank you would have done the trick, even if it wasn't genuine. Getting noticed in a meaningful way is less about the grand gesture and more about the small, thoughtful things we do every day. We found that there's often a pay it forward beauty to going that extra inch. Setting the power of small emotion can be as easy as writing a thank you note that isn't expected or asking after your customer's children by name. Too often in our elbows out world, it's assumed that being considerate and being competitive are mutually exclusive traits. In fact, the opposite is true. Celebrated restaurateur Danny Meyer makes a point of personally writing at least two notes a day to people dining in his restaurant. Whether it's to wish someone a happy anniversary or to congratulate them on a recent promotion, his motivation is simple and heartfelt. I think in a world where you almost have to multitask just to keep up with the profusion of information coming your way, he tells us, the human gesture is one of the unfortunate casualties. He acknowledges his customers in ways they may never realize. For example, when he noticed several lunchtime reservations recently at Union Square Cafe for people with similar political leanings, he strategically placed them within sight of one another. So former Senator Bob Kerry, once a Democratic presidential hopeful, may have thought it was serendipitous to be seated near fundraisers for Senators Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton with a former editor of The Nation nearby, but it was no coincidence. It's chance that they all came to the restaurant on the same day, but by paying attention to small details, I can make good things happen for people. We do this with literary people as well. We also do this with food people. We can do this with advertising people and political people. And people get up out of their seats and they may become reacquainted with someone in their own world that they had not seen for a long time. That then may lead to something else. It all reflects positively back onto having come to the Union Square Cafe or whichever of the restaurants I'm talking about. Being attentive when you don't have to will sharpen your eye for the kinds of details that can make or break your reputation in the business world. Did you follow up on that detail that has almost certainly may have been taken care of on the off chance that it hasn't? Did the messenger service understand that they were to leave a package if there is no doorman? Did the correct email address make it into the ad? Did you acknowledge the contributions of the production staff or marketing folks who helped you on a special project? Double checking is a habit worth developing. Always check small things became an absolute rule for General Colin Powell years before he became a respected military commander and later Secretary of State. Pause. I'm going to say this in this kindest of the way possible. Even in church business, because I know we're talking business business right now, but even in church business, saying thank you goes a long way. Acknowledging the people who you don't pay in ministry Acknowledging the people who you don't pay in ministry, who volunteer their time, their resources, their skill, goes a long way. Especially if they are in business and they're doing pro bono work for your ministry. If they design your flyers for free, thanking them goes a long way. Acknowledging their business goes a long way. Um, and sometimes I, I think that on the church side, people tend to forget that. But it's still the same. If, if someone is doing something um, in a business capacity for you, someone is volunteering for you, it goes a long way to acknowledge people. 
Now, some people may say, hey, I don't want to be acknowledged, and that's fine. You can ask them, is it okay if I acknowledge that you were the one who did this? Sometimes us in business, because we know how people are, <laughs> some of us will say, that's okay. You don't have to acknowledge me because if you do, then I'm going to get all of these other people coming to me wanting pro bono work, thinking that I do pro bono work all the time. All right. So there is a fine balance between the two. But if you ask them, hey, is it OK if I acknowledge your business and, and what you do and they say yes, go ahead and do it. All right. That's that's a definite way to help out business owners who are volunteering their time, their resources, and their skills. Look before you leap. Colin Power was an army officer training as a pathfinder, one of the elite paratroopers who jump in ahead of airborne assaults to mark landing and drop zones. On the last day of the course, Powell relates in his autobiography, the officers faced a treacherous night jump from a helicopter after a day long cross country march. As they were preparing to jump, Powell, as senior officer on board, yelled at the men over the roar of the engines to check their static lines, which automatically opened the parachutes. The lines were supposed to be hooked to a floor cable. Powell called out a second reminder then. Like an old fussy woman, he began checking each line himself. A sergeant's line was loose. The man would almost certainly have plummeted to his death if Powell hadn't caught the mistake that three men the paratrooper, his buddy, and the jump master had already missed. Never neglect details, Powell writes, even to the point of being a pest to others. Moments of stress, confusion, and fatigue are exactly when mistakes happen. Pay a little more attention. We often think about taking that extra step. A nagging thought crosses our minds as we're racing to complete nine other tasks worrying over how far behind we are on the day's to-do list. Unfortunately, we don't heed that inner voice. We forget or we get too busy and that mental post-it gets lost in the tsunami of other demands. Now, one thing I know about myself, and maybe some of you can attest to this, is that if I have a nagging thought and I don't either act on it or I don't take out my phone and text it to myself, that thought will be lost. And usually it's something that I needed to remember. So sometimes when I'm in the middle of my day and a thought comes to my mind or a reminder to do something, I will stop, pull out my phone, text it to myself to make sure that I don't forget what it is um, that that niggling thought, as they're talking about here, came to mind. You really do have to find um, a way to remember those kinds of thoughts. And I can tell you most of the time when I ignore that thought is usually something I wish I wouldn't have ignored. So now I have just learned that, hey, if a thought comes to your mind, call so-and-so, check on something, um, take a look at this, turn this in, whatever it is, I don't want that thought to escape me. So I have a tendency to text it to myself and jot it down. And if I do, it's, it turns out well, but if I don't, I usually wish I would have done it. All right. So he says, we neglect to completely finish one job or to fulfill satisfaction before diving into the next. Everyone, you know, is suffering from the same kind of time crunch challenges. We've all found ourselves on the phone with someone only to hear the telltale sound of a keyboard clicking away in the background. And we've done it all ourselves at one point or another. Whether it's legitimate multitasking or an unscheduled cyber recess, the pace of today's work week seems to, to demand it at times. Author Daniel Goldman refers to this phenomenon as the I-it interaction. A, first, a term first coined by philosopher Marvin Buber. By not fully paying attention to the other person and his or her needs, we deny ourselves the opportunity to create empathy and an emotional attachment with the other person. According to Dr. Goldman, when other tasks or preoccupations begin to split our attention consistently, 
the dwindling reserve left for the other person we are talking with leaves us operating on automatic, paying just enough attention to keep the conversation on track. No wonder the I-IT interaction takes place with increasing frequency at work and at home. It's harder to pay attention in an ADD world. We're surrounded by computer screens, cell phones, TVs, iPods, and bustling people and their demands. All of them crying, look at me. At work, they thwart even our best intentions to focus and complete the job at hand. We may be the first generation to find that more information is actually making us dumber and less productive. Harvard psychiatrist Edward Hallowell has invented a new name for this information age syndrome. He calls it ADT or attention deficit trait. Unlike attention deficit disorder, which has biological causes, ADT is a syndrome we give to ourselves. Hollowell claims that ADT makes us increasingly distracted, irritable, and restless, and over the long term, underachieving. It amounts to a form of self-inflicted failure. If we want to give a little extra to our job, to a project, or to other people, we need to stop trying to do so many things at once. To help avoid attention deficit trait disasters at the Kaplan-Thaler Group, we abide by the read twice and send once rule. And I want to say, don't read it twice. Read it three times. <laughs> Especially in the world of spell check that doesn't spell anything right. Did y'all hear me? I was a spelling bee champ. So when I look at my post and I look up and about five or six things are misspelled in it, it irritates me. All right. Thank God Facebook now has an edit button because I was praying for that for a very long time. Lord, please, please let this application add edit. Some of you will note that I will take someone else's post that I really, really like and I will copy their text. <laughs> and I will edit it. And I will take out all of their misspellings. And then I will post it to my page and give them credit. I know people think that's a little OCD, but I do it. I do because I can't stand it. <laughs> but I will credit the person with what they said, but I'm going to edit your words. I'm just going to I'm going to tell you that up front because I love you. I'm going to edit your post and then I'm going to post it to my page. <laughs> I'm sorry because I edit for a living, right? And so when I see stuff, and I'm an educator, so when I see all of these, just, I'm like, Lord, okay, I can deal with one or two. But when you got 20 misspellings in your post, just know I'm going to like your post. I'm going to tell you it was a great concept. It was great words, great ideas, great thoughts, but just know I'm going to copy your text. I'm going to edit it. I'm going to correct your misspellings. And then I'm gonna post it to my page. I'm just I'm I'm being honest. I'm telling you what I'm gonna do. <laughs> so um please please forgive me because I do, I do that. Um one of the things he says here that I wanna go back to is this attention deficit trait. Many of you know because I've said it before on here, I try not to pick up my phone to look at social media before 10 o'clock. Now, granted, I'm usually maybe sometimes going to bed at 1, 2, 3 o'clock. So I try not to look at my phone before 10 o'clock. Um, people text me stuff all, all, at all times of the day and night. All right. And that's okay because... I leave my phone in a totally different place from where I'm sleeping. So I don't have to hear the bloop, the bloop, the ping, the ping, the bing, the bing all night long. Sometimes I turn off my sound notifications. Um, and I believe that you have to put some limitations on how much you are checking your social media. So for me, 
When I wake up, I don't check in with social media. I check in with the Lord. I need to hear what he's saying to me before I hear what someone else is saying or an article somebody wants me to look at or something that somebody wants me to pray about because sometimes in my prayer time, I've already covered something that somebody has requested for me to pray. So I can just say, hey, sister, brother, that was actually in my morning prayer this morning. I was praying specifically about that. I'm going to agree with you that all will go well. Amen. But again, what he's talking about here is, is very important. We have to make sure that we are taking time for ourselves, for the people in our life. Now, when I go to dinner, I used to be, didn't be, I, I, I have improved on this, but now when I go to dinner, I try to put my phone face down away from my plate so that I am not encouraged to be on the phone all through dinner. All right. Especially when I look over and I see other people who are supposed to be at a table full of people talking and interacting. And even I notice that everybody has their device in their hand and nobody's talking to each other. So these are things that we can improve at that as they say, as he says here, these things become self-inflicted in terms of our relationships with other people, right? They're not things that, that are being forced on us or they're not biological things that are happening. Um, they're just things that we have to take control of in our own life. So he said, she says here that they have a company rule that before they put anything out, they read it twice and they send it once. I say, read it three times. Read it three times and then send it. Um, why? Because that helps you to catch mistakes. As we just said, self, um, spell check does not really check very well. Spell check does not check grammar. So sometimes I go even a step further by reading something aloud to see if it sounds right. Sometimes you can catch your grammatical errors that way. If you read it aloud to yourself and then you'll see, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Let me put in the right, you know, adjectives or whatever, or pronouns or whatever. She says here, it may seem obvious or even trivial, but it speaks to an entire mindset that we try to foster, which is pause. Take that extra minute to make sure you make sure the address is correct on something. Make sure the invoice you sent to a supplier was actually received. Did you know that a small percentage of digital correspondence actually gets lost in cyberspace? If you misspell something, if you put the wrong number on it, especially for emails, if you put a dash where there's supposed to be an underscore, some digital correspondence can actually get lost. And then you will be upset saying, I know I sent this person an email or I know I sent this person a message and they're telling me they never got it. When it's in most cases, they usually never did get it. So you might have to resend it. You may have to check the email. Um, most people are getting better about this. They're trying not to have email names that are really, really long, right? They're trying to shorten, shorten their email. That's why my email is reach Shantae because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to reach me. So they try to make so they try to simplify their emails so that people have less problems communicating with them. As anyone who has ever tried frantically to retrieve an errant email can tell you, taking that extra 20 seconds to be a proofreader is one of the most valuable things you can do. It helped us avoid a near disaster recently. All right. So those are a couple things about small talk about communication that you might want to pay attention to. Moving right along, let's take a look at P.T. Barnum. And this book is called The Little Book of Business Wisdom by Peter Krause, Rules of Success from, the, from More Than 50 Business Legends. All right? People whose businesses have been here 50, 75, 100 years or more. P.T. Barnum. 
The greatest showman on earth was raised on a Connecticut farm, but decided early in life that he preferred laying plans for money making over physical labor. As a young man, he worked as a clerk for local merchants and then bought his own shop in New York City. In 1835, he turned to entertainment when he bought and displayed Joyce Heth, a black slave reputed to be 161 years old and to have been George Washington's nurse. So, P.T. Barnum, in case most people don't know, got his start in the entertainment industry by buying and displaying a black slave. who was reputed to be 161 years old. Barnum, who applied sobering common sense to ruling over his wild empire, founded the American Museum in New York in 1841 to display all sorts of human curiosities and grisly items from around the world. His coup de grace was his extravagant Barnum Circus founded in 1871 which has now recently retired as the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. So a lot of um, people went to this circus for a very long time before they realized what the roots of this particular circus was. All right. Barnum's rules for success in business. Number one, he says, select the kind of business that suits your natural inclinations and temperament. Some men are naturally mechanics. Others have a strong aversion to anything like machinery and so on. A man has a natural taste for one occupation or for another. I am glad that we do not all feel and think alike, Dick Homespun said. For if we did, everybody would think that my girl was the sweetest creature in all creation and they would all be trying to date her at once. I never could succeed as a merchant I have tried it unsuccessfully several times. I never could be content with a fixed salary. For mine is a purely speculative disposition, while others are just the reverse. Therefore, all should be careful to select a occupation that suits them best. Somebody say, that's about right. <laughs> if you don't like numbers, I probably would not encourage you to become an accountant. If you do not like reading, I would not encourage you to become a lawyer. You're going to do a lot of reading. A lot. So again, select the kind of business that best suits your temperament. Number two, let your word be ever sacred. Let your word or your pledge be ever sacred. Never promise to do something without performing it with the most rigid promptness. Nothing is more valuable to a person in business than a name of always doing as you agree. And to that moment, a strict adherence to this rule gives a person the command of half the spare funds within the range of his acquaintance and encircles him with a host of friends who may be depended upon in almost any conceivable emergency. So let your word be your word. Let your word be true. Um, we know that there are exceptions to this, right? If someone has, God forbid, a life-threatening emergency, life-debilitating accident, whatever. But for the most part, if you are in business, let your word be your word. Number three, whatever you do, do it with all your might. Work at it if necessarily early and late, in season and out of season, not leaving a stone unturned and never deferring for a single hour that which can be done right now. The old proverb is full of truth and meaning. Whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. Many a man acquires a fortune by doing his business thoroughly while his neighbor remains poor for life because he only half does his business. Ambition, energy, industry, perseverance are indispensable requisites for success in business. Number four, sobriety. 
Use no description of intoxications or drinks. As no man can succeed in business unless he has a brain to enable him to lay his plans and reason to guide him in their execution, no matter how bountifully a man may be blessed with intelligence, if his brain is muddled or confused and his judgment is warped by intoxicating drinks, it is impossible for him to carry on business successfully. How many good opportunities have passed never to return while a man was sipping a social glass with his friend? How many foolish bargains have been made under the influence of alcohol, which temporarily makes its victims so poor? How many important chances have been put off until tomorrow and thence forever because the wine cup has thrown the system into a state of relaxation, neutralizing the energies essential to success in business? The use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage is as much an infatuation as is the smoking of opium by the Chinese, and the former is quite as destructive to the success of the businessman as the latter, which is interesting because China dealt with their opium problem, and now America has an opium problem. Look at how far China has exceeded once they dealt with the drug addiction problem of their entire country. That's a whole other show. <laughs> Number five, let hope predominate, but be not too visionary. Many persons are always kept poor because they are too visionary. Every project looks to them like certain success, and therefore they keep changing from one business to another, always in hot water, always under the harrow. The plan of counting the chickens before they are hatched is an era of ancient date, but it is, does not seem to improve by age. Number six, do not scatter your powers. Engage in one kind of business and stick to it faithfully until you succeed or until you conclude that you need to abandon it. A constant hampering on one nail will generally drive it home at last so that it can be clenched. When a man's undivided attention is centered on one object, his mind will constantly be suggesting improvements of value, which would escape him if his brain were occupied with many things at once. Many a fortune has slipped through men's fingers by engaging in too many occupations at once. Seven, engage proper employees. Never employ a man of bad habits when one whose habits are good and can be found to fill his position. I've generally been extremely fortunate in having faithful and competent people to fill the responsible situations in my business. And a man can scarcely be too grateful for such a blessing. When you find a person unfit to fill their position, either from incapacity or character or disposition, dispense with their services. Do not drag out a miserable existence in a vain attempt to change that person's nature. It is utterly impossible to do so. You cannot make a silk purse. He was created for some other sphere. Let them find and fill that sphere. Number eight, advertise your business. Do not hide your light under a bushel. Mm, that's a new twist on that verse. Whatever your occupation or calling may be, if it needs support from the public, advertise it thoroughly and efficiently in some shape or other that will arrest public attention. I freely confess that what success I have had in my life may fairly be attributed more to the public press than to nearly all other causes combined. There may be possibility for occupations that do not require advertising, but I cannot well conceive very few that are. Men in business will sometimes tell you that they have tried advertising and that it did not pay. This is only when advertising is done sparingly. Homeopathic doses of advertising will not pay because it's like half a potion of a medicine. It makes the patient sick, but affects nothing. So administer liberal advertising and the cure will be sure and permanent. 
Some say they cannot afford to advertise. They mistake. They cannot afford not to advertise. In this country, where everyone reads papers, magazines, let me add, social media, the man must have a thick skull who does not see that these are the cheapest and best mediums through which he can speak to the public, where he is to find his customers. Put on the appearance of business and, the, and generally the reality will, farm, will follow. The farmer plants his seed while he is sleeping. His corn and potatoes are growing. So the same with advertising. While you are sleeping or eating or conversing with one set of customers, your advertisement is being read by hundreds and thousands of people who've, who have never seen you, nor have heard of your business and never would, had it not been for your advertisement. The businessmen of this country do not, as a general thing, appreciate the business, the advantage of advertising thoroughly. Occasionally, the public are aroused at the witnessing of the success and express astonishment at the rapidity of which certain gentlemen acquire fortunes, but they don't reflect that the same path is open to all who dare pursue it. It needs nerve and faith, the former to enable you to launch out thousands of uncertain waters of the future, the latter to teach you that after many days it shall return, bringing a hundred or thousand fold to him who appreciates the advantages of printer's ink and advertising when properly applied. He just used another verse of scripture, if y'all caught that. He used the scripture that talked about casting your bread out onto the waters and many days it will um, return to you in terms of advertising. Number nine, avoid extravagance and always live considerably within your income. If you can do so without absolute starvation. Let me say that again. Because we started this whole broadcast off with what? <laughs> Living within your budget. Avoid extravagance and always live considerably within your income if you can do so without absolute starvation. It needs no profit to tell us. No profit. P-R-O-P-H-E-T. You don't need a profit to tell you that those who live fully up to their means without any thought of a reverse in life can never attain to a independence. That was good. That was really good. I'm going to read it again. You don't need a prophet to tell you that those who live fully up to their means without any thought of any reversal in life can never attain to independence. Men and women accustomed to gratifying every whim and caprice will find it hard at first to cut down unnecessary expenses and will feel it a great self-denial to live in a smaller house than they have been accustomed to with less expensive furniture, less company, less costly clothing, less number of balls, parties, theater goings, carriage ridings, pleasure excursions, liquor drinkings, etc. But after all, if they will try the plan of laying by a nest egg, or in other words, saving up small sums of money after paying all their expenses, they will be surprised at the pleasure derived from adding to their little pile, as well as from all the econ economical habits which follow in the pursuit of this peculiar pleasure. The old suit of clothes and the old bonnet and dress will answer for another season. The croton or spring water will taste better than champagne. A brisk walk will prove more exhil exhilarating than a ride in the finest coach. A social family chat or a evening's reading, an hour's play, will be far more pleasant than a $50 or $500 party when the reflection on the difference in cost is indulged by those who begin to know the pleasures of saving. <laughs> This man is preaching. Thousands of men are kept poor and tens of thousands are made after so, after so after they have acquired quite sufficient to support them well through life in consequence of laying their plans of living on too expensive a platform. Some families in this country expend $20,000 per year and some much more and would scarcely know how to live on a less sum. Prosperity is a more severe ordeal than adversity, 
especially sudden prosperity. Easy come, easy go is an old and true proverb. Pride, when permitted its full sway, is a great undying canker worm which gnaws the very vitals of a man's worldly possessions. Let them be small or great, hundreds or millions. Many persons, as they begin to prosper, immediately commence expending for luxuries until in a short time their expenses begin to swallow up their income and they become ruined in their ridiculous attempts to keep up appearances and make a sensation. Come on and preach today. I know a gentleman of fortune who says that when he first began to prosper, his wife would have a new and elegant sofa. That sofa, he says, cost me $30,000. The riddle is thus explained. When the sofa reached the house, it was found necessary to get chairs to match, sideboards, carpets, tables to correspond, and so on through the entire stock of furniture. When at last it was found that the house itself was quite too small and old fashioned for the furniture, and one new one was built to correspond with the sofa, Thus, added my friend, running up an outlay of $30,000 caused by that single sofa and saddling onto me in the shape of servants, equipment, necessary expenses, keeping up the establishment, $11,000 extra dollars, and a tight pinch at that. Whereas, 10 years ago, we lived with a much more real comfort because much less care on as many hundreds. The truth is, he continued, that sofa would have brought me to inevitable bankruptcy had not a most unexampled tide of prosperity kept me above it. Now you got to remember, this is back in the 1800s that he's talking, cost. Lastly, number 10, do not depend upon others. Your success must depend upon you in exerting your own individual energy. Trust not to the assistance of friends, but learn that every man must be the architect of his own fortune. With proper attention to the foregoing rules and such observations as a man of sense will pick up in his own experience, the road to competence will not, I think, usually be found a difficult one. P.T. Barnum, y'all. I think he I think he laid out some very important points and I think we know where he got them from. He's probably been reading proverbs. <laughs> Lastly, as we close, we're going to look really briefly at the first section of this book, The Truth, A Citizen's Guide to Separating Facts from Lies and Stopping Fake News in Its Tracks. If you've heard recently, it was released this week that um, the Roland Martin News Show has been canceled. Put some hearts on the screen if you have heard about this. Now, the report says that it has been canceled to, due to budget cuts, but many people are upset and they're outraged because Roland Martin was just getting on a roll. <laughs> he was getting on a roll with a lot of stuff, right? And so I've heard people and I've seen people writing on social media lately saying, well, who is going to speak for us? Who's going to speak um, for the black community? Like Roland Martin, we know was very well known in terms of speaking to issues that matter to us, right? And so one of the things that I put out there is there are people who are speaking to the black community. You just have to find them. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> There are people who are truth tellers, but one of the things that I pointed out was because the networks are, um, in, in case you didn't realize it, most times media caters to whoever is the president in office, okay? Just in case you haven't figured that out. Um, because, and if you notice with this particular president, he has been really outspoken about coming against news, coming against media, calling certain news news pundits and news outlets fake news, even though they are not, all right? Some news outlets are going to present their news from a certain viewpoint, either what they call conservative 
or what they call li uh, liberal or they're going to be kind of a mix in between. All right. But what this president has done is he has almost made it um, most most networks kind of fearful about some of the news that they're reporting and some of the anchors that they have. And so because he's attacking media in such a way, it's causing people who are trying to pre present a fair and balanced view to kind of step aside when really they don't need to be stepping aside because somebody needs to be presenting more than one side. All right. And so people are looking at what has happened with Roland Martin and they're saying, what is really going on? Because we know that Roland was reporting a lot in terms of things that were happening in the black community, things that were happening unjustly in the black community. And he was pretty fair. Um, he would have um, people who had liberal viewpoints on, and he would also have people on who had very, very, very conservative views. So he was a fair, pretty much a fair and balanced presentation of whatever he was giving. So now that he is off, one of the things that I'm saying to people is, you, you're going to have to dig. You have to do a little bit of digging, but there are people who are still out there presenting balanced viewpoints. Um, one of them is Breaking Brown. Um, her name is Yvette Carnell. She actually pre presents a pretty balanced viewpoint. Um, another gentleman who is doing um, news is Benjamin Dixon. All right. These are people you're going to have to search for who are presenting fair and balanced news. They're not on major networks, but they are presenting fair and balanced news. All right. So because you have to understand what's happening, there's issues going on right now with net neutrality. They're trying to, de they're trying to decide if people are going to still have the freedom of the internet like we have right now, or are they going to take away net neutrality, which means, again, less fair and balanced reporting being presented to the population. So you need to pay attention to what's happening around that, because if these um, things go through that they want to push through, it's going to push people who are balanced further and further out of mainstream news and mainstream Internet. That's what's happening. So this is a pretty important book and I'm going to try to get through the first section here in a few minutes. So I hope you all won't mind if I go over about five minutes. All right. So the book starts out by saying this, why the traditional media no longer serves our needs. Key points. The fairness doctrine has become obsolete and cannot be revived. Conservatives were, underser were underserved for many years by traditional media. Progressives were slow to embrace new media, such as talk radio. So he says here, people have never really been happy with the news media. They have blamed it for lying, misinforming, and being unfair to one side or the other. Even Thomas Jefferson expressed views on this subject that many people today no doubt would share. In an 1807 letter to John Norvell, Jefferson wrote, to your request of my opinion of the manner in which a newspaper should be conducted, I should answer by restraining it to true facts and sound principles only. Yet I fear such a paper would find few subscribers. It is a melancholy truth that a suppression of the press could not be more completely deprive the nation of its benefits than is done by its abandoned prostitution to falsehood. Nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. The real extent of this state of misinformation is known only to those who are in situations to confront facts within their knowledge with the lies of the day. I will add that the man who never looks into a newspaper is better informed than he who reads them, inasmuch as he who knows nothing is nearer to truth than whose mind is filled with 